Well, to say the least, as we've been studying through the book of Ephesians, especially those first few verses on election and predestination, and I've enjoyed it in this sense, not just teaching and preaching through it, but to hear the conversations after the service that sometime I'm privy to. And one conversation I heard in particular, which was encouraging to hear us talk about those things. That it's not once we say amen, the book is closed, but as we say to always, as our brother and elder Rick told us last week in his prayer, that we would discuss of these things even after on Sunday and for the week that's following. So I'm always encouraged when I hear people discussing it after. And one of the things we have found out and, and know is that this doctrine of election and predestination is a great divide, even in the Christian church. And it's divisive because many people have opposing views on it. But I want to make unequivocally clear that just because there's something that's in the Bible that there are differing views on, that doesn't mean that you cannot be certain about it. Let me repeat that. That just because there are differing views on this doctrine, the doctrine of election and predestination, that does not mean that you cannot be certain about it. Let me ask you some questions. How certain are you personally that you are a sinner? How certain are you that Jesus Christ is God? How certain are you that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin conceived by the Holy Spirit and came and lived here on earth? How certain are you that Jesus Christ died as a substitute for sins? How certain are you that Jesus rose victoriously from the grave the third day? And how certain are you that you are justified that in God's courtroom you are declared righteous in his eyes by faith alone, not by any self-righteous works or religion of your own? How certain are you of those things? If you're not certain of those things, do not put your head on the pillow tonight unless you're certain of those things. And I hope that if you're not certain, God gives you unrest. But for those of you who are certain of those things, yes, and you say, I am certain that I'm a wretched sinner. I'm certain that Jesus is God. I'm certain that he came here to earth and he died on the cross for my sins and he rose again. And I'm declared righteous only by faith in him alone. Well, I'm telling you this morning that despite the divisiveness in the church today over this issue, you can be as certain of, those, of sovereign election as you are of those things. But not with arrogance, as we've said. Always in humility. Remember with me Jesus' interaction with Peter. Who do people say that I am? He said to the disciples, right? <clears throat> Some say Elijah, one of the prophets. Who do you say that I am? And Peter, of course, the spokesman of the group. You are the Christ the son of the living God. And what did Jesus say to him? Peter, you said this to me because you are smarter and more spiritual than the rest of the disciples. No, he said to him, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. So we studied in Ephesians, as we know from chapter one, verses three to 14, is the entire work of the triune God that we worship. The work of the Father, verses 3 to 6. The work of the Son, which we're about to endeavor on, verses 7 to 12. And the work of the Spirit, verses 13 to 14. We finished the first of our triune God, the work of the Father. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm sure by now, after doing it for eight weeks, it's ringing in your ears. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly places with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And the first blessing he says in verse 4 is, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be blameless and holy before him. In love, he predestined us to himself for adoption according to the glorious riches of his grace. So I'm sure you may have noticed in your bulletin, there must have been a typo. Doesn't the pastor know when in verse 7? of Ephesians 1, what is going on? Well, look at, think of it this way. 
because this is such an important aspect of the work of God the Father, we will come back to Ephesians. Think of it this way. I remember my wife and I years ago before we had children, we had an opportunity to go on a, on a cruise. Many of you have gone on cruises before? So we would go, and actually we met some good Christian friends from New Mexico, which to this day we're, we're friends with, Sam and Susan. We happen to be on the same cruise together in God's providence. And the ship would dock at an island for a day or two. But while we were on that island, we would have excursions with other little boats, catamarans to some other stuff. So that's how I want you to think of this. Though Ephesus was not a seaport, it's in modern-day Turkey, we've docked our ship at Ephesus. But for the next two, three, or four weeks, we're making a little excursion in Romans chapter 9, which is going to highlight what Ephesians 1, 3 to 6 has taught us in how many verses? Three verses. In Romans 9, he uses the whole chapter to discuss sovereign election. So please turn me with me there to Romans chapter 9. And this morning, we're going to study the first five verses. Join me on the catamaran ride. And in about four weeks, we'll be back on the main island of Ephesus. Romans chapter 9. First five verses. <clears throat> I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. Now, as Paul begins this chapter, it's important to know, as I've already highlighted, that this chapter in particular is about sovereign election, what we've been studying in Ephesians 1, 3-6. Notice with me some of the verses spread out throughout this chapter that highlight God's sovereign election. Verse 11. In order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. Verse 13. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Verse 16. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. And verse 18, so then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. That's just big picture overview. We'll get into the details as we get into our next few weeks. But to show you that Paul's emphasis here is truly sovereign election. Well, knowing that, I want you to notice from our text this morning, how does Paul begin? Where's his starting point? He doesn't begin, and he will get into it, and we will get into it ourselves as we study this, into the details of God's sovereign election in salvation. When we say sovereign election, remember when we started our series in Ephesians, we're talking about this, that God is sovereign over four areas of life. God is sovereign over suffering, the four S's I call them. God is sovereign over sin without being the author of sin. He's not the author of sin or evil, but when others sin against you, as Joseph's brothers did, God was sovereign over that. God is sovereign over sovereigns, earthly sovereigns. So he's sovereign over sovereign, over sin and earthly sovereigns. But he's also in Romans 9 and in Ephesians 1, he's sovereign over salvation. That's a sticking point for many people. 
Yeah, he's sovereign over suffering, and he's sovereign over when others sins against, sin against me, and he's sovereign over earthly rulers and sovereigns. But before he gets into talking about God's sovereign election or God's sovereignty and salvation, Paul, as the pastor that he is, as the shepherd that he is, these opening verses reminds me of Philippians chapter 1, where Paul says in verse 8 to the Philippian church, I long to see you with the affection of Jesus Christ. It's not just some chosen, frozen theology. And here we see in Romans 9 at the opening, he wears his emotions and his heart on his sleeve, as it were. So let me walk you through these. There's four headings that I want to bring to your attention to help you understand where Paul is going here. The first one is this, the veracity of Paul's burden for the lost. The veracity of Paul's burden for the lost. You saw in your program the title, the whole section is sovereign election, God's sovereignty and salvation. <clears throat> but here, as I have written in the title, is burdened for the lost. And the apostle Paul was burdened for the lost. That's his main point and his thrust in this section. But the first part of that that we see is the veracity of Paul's burden for the lost. And he wants to show us the veracity of his burden. And he begins in verse 1 by saying four things. First, I'm speaking the truth. Now, this is Holy Writ. This is the Bible, right? This is 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is breathed out, theopneustos, theonustos, as my American friends would say, by God. This is God's words. Men spoke from God, 2 Peter 1.21, as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So that alone would be sufficient enough for us to just read what Paul was, what's on Paul's heart. Uh, but it goes, he goes beyond that, and he begins by saying, I'm speaking the truth. I'm not just speaking the truth. I'm speaking the truth where? In Christ. That would have been enough, but he doesn't stop there. Look what he says secondly. I am not lying. Okay? You just told us you're speaking the truth, and you're not just speaking the truth in and of yourself. You're doing it in Christ. And now he says, I'm not lying. He, he's trying to emphasize over and over and over again, not so much, yes, what he's going to say in the whole chapter about the doctrine of sovereign election, but also what he's going to reveal about his heart in these verses. And then he says, thirdly, as if that wasn't enough, I'm first speaking the truth in Christ. There's the veracity of my burden for the lost that I'm about to share with you. I am not lying, but thirdly, my conscience bears me witness. My conscience bears me witness. Early in the book of Romans, Paul highlighted what this term means. In Romans 2, verse 5, he says, they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. That's what conscience does. Conscience either accuses or excuses. Think of it like a traffic light. Green, go. Yellow, for some of you, it's go faster. <laughs> I saw you spit out of here the other week. Green, green, go. Yellow, slow down. Red, stop. And if you violate it, there's where conscience comes in. Now, of course, conscience can be seared, Paul says in 2 Timothy 4. But here Paul says, my conscience bears me witness. Paul knew about conscience. He said before the king in Acts 23, and at, actually at the Sanhedrin council, it says in Acts 23, verse 1, and looking intently at the council, Paul said, brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. What a statement. And that's what he's calling on here, his conscience. Acts 24, 16, Paul said, so I always take pains to have a clear conscience toward both God and man. Or I love how he puts it in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12. For our boast is this, the testimony of our conscience that we behaved in the world with simplicity simplicity and godly sincerity. 
And that's what Paul is doing here in the opening verses before he says what he's about to say. I'm, I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness. And if that wasn't enough, look at the fourth thing he says. In whom? The Holy Spirit. I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. Number two, my conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. He's bookending what he's about to say, the veracity of it, the truthfulness, by calling on the second and third members of the Trinity. I'm speaking the truth in Christ. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. This is true what I'm about to say. It's so true that I'm referring to Christ and the Spirit of God. That's the veracity of my burden that I'm about to share with you. Number two, we not only see the veracity of Paul's burden for the lost, we see the intensity of Paul's burden for the lost. That's in verse two, the intensity of Paul's burden. That I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. I have a question to ask you as I asked myself when I was studying this. What are the things in my life that have caused me great sorrow? What are the things in, in your life that have caused you unceasing anguish? It could be the loss of a loved one. It could be the loss of a job. It could be a difficult relationship. Whatever it is that life brings us by God's providence, you say, yeah, those times in my life I had some great sorrow and some of you might have them now I've had unceasing anguish but here Paul's great sorrow and unceasing anguish is over a burden for the loss it's not just sorrow notice if you will with me and it's not just anguish it's it's great sorrow it's tremendous and his anguish he says is unceasing meaning it continues and he said, as I said in the outset, I'm not just making this up, Paul says. I'm speaking the truth. I'm not lying. Christ and the Holy Spirit can bear me witness. This is the state of my heart continually. I have anguish in my heart that's unending and unceasing. A deep burden for lost people. So we've all had anguish. We've all had sorrow as I've said, over different circumstances in our life, difficulty. But how's your heart meter? Because Paul says this great sorrow and unceasing anguish is where? In his heart. It's not just the heady theology of the doctrine of predestination. But if it doesn't do anything to your heart, you've missed the boat and the catamaran. When was the last time you and I had this kind of anguish, this burden for lost people. Paul says this has to be intense. Thirdly, we see the reality of Paul's burden for the lost. The reality of Paul's burden for the lost. That's in verse 3. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ. Wow. Those are strong words. He's saying this for himself. That he would be accursed and cut off from Christ. The Greek word accursed is the word anathema. Literally means to devote to destruction in eternal hell. It's always connected to that. Always. You mean to say, Pastor, that... Paul is wishing that he was in hell for those he's burdened for who are lost so that they wouldn't go to hell. Yes, that's exactly what he's saying. Paul uses this term elsewhere. 1 Corinthians 16, 22. If anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. People who are not genuinely saved, that's evidenced by their love for the Lord, they will be accursed in hell. Turn with me for a moment to highlight the reality of Paul's burden to Galatians, just a couple of books over to the right. Chapter 1, to show you this word that Paul uses 
to display the reality of his burden. This word accursed in anathema, verses 6 to 9. And the context there is just to give you a little bit of context. We're not studying Galatians, but I'm sharing this to show you a deeper understanding of Paul's emotion here in the reality of his burden when he says, I wish I was accursed. The context is that there were these false teachers known as Judaizers who were first introduced in the Bible historically in Acts chapter 15 who were preaching a different gospel. And notice what Paul says in Galatians 1 about them, verses 6, beginning. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to, here it is, a different gospel. Verse 7, not that there is another one, but there are some, that's the Judaizers, who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. So he's setting this up. There's these Judaizers, these false teachers who have given you a different gospel. It's not the true gospel. They're distorting the gospel, the true gospel. And then he includes himself in this, in the way that he does in Romans chapter 9, verse 3. He says, but even if we, including himself, the apostle, or he says, an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be, here it is, a curse, damned to hell. Verse 9, as we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone, now he's making it, it's not just the Judaizers, it's not just if I were to start teaching you a different gospel, or even if it ever were an angel from heaven, but if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be anathema, accursed. That's how important it is that the gospel can't be distorted. And there are churches today that don't even preach the true gospel. They've distorted it. That's what Paul is getting at back to Romans 9, verse 3, when he says of himself, that's the reality of what Paul has in his burden for the lost, that I want to be accursed, and then notice in verse 3 of our text, and cut off, separated from Christ. He makes it doubly clear what that word means. That's the burden. that has kind of taken over his whole being. And last but not least, the fourth heading in our text, I call it the community of Paul's burden. Paul is wishing upon himself that he would be accursed and cut off, separated from Christ, that he would be damned to hell for the sake of whom? For whose sake? He makes it abundantly clear here in verse 3. For the sake of my brothers. Who is he referring to? He specifies, my kinsmen according to the flesh. For my fellow Jews. Paul said later in the book of Romans, Romans 11, verse 2, for I myself, just a couple of chapters over, I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. Or as he put it in the book of Philippians, chapter 3, verse 5, Speaking of himself, circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. My burden is for my kinsmen, my fellow Jewish people. Which is interesting because as we'll see through Romans 9, as I said, the theme is sovereign election. But as we'll see in the next few weeks, Paul develops this. Well, what about my people, the Jews? Paul, remember, was a minister the apostle to the Gentiles. But yet he had a burden and a passion for the lost condition of his own people. And then he continues in verse 4 of our text to describe this community, the Jewish community. They are Israelites, verse 4, and to them belong, and now he lists eight things. What belongs to them? Number one, he says the adoption. Now, you want to be careful. Do not confuse this Confuse this with the adoption that we talked about in Ephesians 1.5. That adoption was salvific in nature because he says in love, he predestined us to adoption to himself. This is not Ephesians 1.5. How do we know that? Well, even from the context, which we'll get into next week. Look at the very next verses right there in Romans 9, verses 6 to 8. For not, for not all who are descended from Israel, that, that's meaning who are physical 
descendants of Israel belong to Israel, to believers, to spiritual descendants. And not all are children of Abraham, that is by faith, simply because they are Abraham's offspring, his physical descendants. And we'll get into that a little bit more as we study that. The point being here that when he uses the term adoption, he's not saying that all Jews are adopted into God's family. So if that's not what he means, what does he mean? This is what he means. The Jews, God's people in the Old Testament. Exodus 4.22. This is what he means by the term adoption. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord. This was with Moses and the people of Israel being slaves in Egypt. Thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. That's what he means by the term adoption. Or to put it the way the minor prophet Hosea 11 verse 1 puts it, when Israel was a child, I loved him and out of Egypt I called my son. Or to put it yet a different way to understand this term adoption. Deuteronomy 32, 9 to 10. But the Lord's portion is his people. That's the Jewish people. Jacob, his allotted heritage, he found him in a desert land in, in the howling waste of the wilderness. He encircled him. He cared for him. He kept them as the apple of his eye. That's it. That's what he's referring to here. Israel is God's chosen, firstborn son, the apple of his eye. But not only that, they have the adoption. They have number two, notice in our text, the glory. We've already talked about that in our study from Ephesians 1 and I'm not going to go into it any further according to the glorious riches of his grace what the term glory means that's the Shekinah glory that's God's presence that's God's dwelling amongst men and how did he reveal his glory in the Old Testament in the pillar of cloud as he led them there in the Holy of Holies over the mercy seat the Shekinah glory of God was dwelling amongst men and if that wasn't enough they have the covenants well, the Abrahamic covenant, there would be the father of many nations. He will bless all nations through him. The Davidic covenant, that he'll always have somebody to sit on his throne. Fourthly, the giving of the law. That's the Mosaic law, the Ten Commandments, and all the law that included in there. The civil law, the ceremonial law, and the moral law, which is the Ten Commandments. And that's why early in the book of Romans, Paul says in Romans 3, 2, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. That's the very law of God, given on tablets of stone and more so than that. Fifthly, the worship. Some translations say the temple service. The Greek term latria means worship. Latrevo. It's a reference to the sacrificial system of the Old Testament. That was part of their worship. And obviously it was a preview for the ultimate sacrifice. That's what he's referring to there in the worship. Sixthly, the promises. The promises more than likely refer to the promises of a coming Messiah. It was their own prophets who prophesied. David and Moses, a prophet like me. And Isaiah, on and on. And then verse 5, to them belong, number 6, the patriarchs. How many times we read in the Old Testament? The God of who? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they are the patriarchs. They are of the Israelites, the physical, ethnic Jew. That's a lot of stuff. And he's burdened for these people, his own people, that he would be damned to hell so that they wouldn't be. After all, Look at what they have. They have the adoption. They're the firstborn, as it were, the apple of God's eye. They have the glory, the Shekinah glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, the whole sacrificial system, the promises, the patriarchs. And if that wasn't enough, look at the eighth one. This is the culmination in verse 5 there. And from their race, according to the flesh, that's ethnic Israel, according to the flesh, is whom? The Christ. I love witnessing when the opportunity arises to Jewish people. My boss is Jewish, I said. I remember at one of our previous churches, one of the ladies who got baptized, she was a new believer, and all of her friends, which was a great opportunity, at work and she and elsewhere were Jewish. And her Jewish friends, I said, 
bring them along. And so my primary audience was her Jewish non-believing friends. So not once did I open the New Testament. And from the Old Testament, I proclaimed the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ to her Jewish friends. What an opportunity. And that's what Paul wants. These are, these are my kinsmen, according to the flesh. And from their race is the Christ. Actually, that's how he begins the opening of the book of Romans, to show that according to the flesh is the Christ. Romans 1, the first three verses, he says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through the prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was, Romans 1, 3, descended from David according to the flesh. Or as Paul puts it in 2 Timothy 2, 8, remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David. So they have all these blessings. God gave them. Remember on Mount Sinai, the law. Remember the, the worship and the sacrificial system, the patriarchs, the promises, the Shekinah glory. And not only that, but from their race came the Christ, the Messiah. But notice what he says as he continues in verse Five, what he says of Christ. And from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ. Christ, we know, is the New Testament equivalent of the term Messiah. It literally means anointed one. That he was anointed by whom? By the Father. The Son was anointed by the Father. Think with me back to Luke chapter 9 on the Mount of Transfiguration, where the three disciples, Peter, James, and John, saw Jesus transform before them with Moses representing the law and Elijah representing the prophets. And Peter's like, this is great. Let's build some tents here. Let's camp out. And then in that entire experience, which Peter relates again as he writes 2 Peter chapter 1 in his letter, the voice from heaven came from God the Father, and it said this, this he is my chosen one. He is my chosen one. Listen to him. That's what Paul is referring to here, the Christ. But then what does he say? Verse 5. Who is what? God. Deity. God over who? Over all. So we have Christ anointed, who is God, deity. And now over all, we have sovereignty. All in one person. Who is this person? It's Jesus, the Christ. Overall, sovereign Lord, supreme ruler, Lord over all, King of kings and Lord of lords. That's why Jesus could say before he went back to heaven in Matthew 28, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. He has all supreme authority. Only Jesus does. Well, how is Paul going to finish this? Here he's, he's burdened for his own people. He's about to embark on a teaching of the doctrine of salvation and saying, I wish I was accursed for my brethren because they have all this. And not only that, but Christ, the Messiah, the anointed of the father came from their race and he is Christ. He is God. He is sovereign. How is he going to finish? Verse five, bless forever. Amen. Bless forever. Amen. Who is blessed? Christ. He's praising Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 6.15, he who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He alone is to be blessed. In him alone is salvation found. He came from the Jewish line. It was prophesied. That's the text. That's Paul's burden for the lost. Now comes our application. Do you have a passionate zeal for evangelism. Well, you say, Pastor, I'm not evangelist. I'm, I'm not an evangelist. It's not what I asked. <clears throat> Do you have a zeal to give the good news, the evangel? Are you, as Paul is here, burdened for the lost? Have you experienced great sorrow and unceasing anguish in your heart over the lost spiritual condition of others in your life? Have you ever, even to this extent, wished of yourself, like Paul, that you were damned to hell so that others would not be? Well, how do I get that if I don't have it? 
Let me give you some help. And this is the application. The four Ps. Number one, pray. Pray. The book end of Romans 9, 1 to 5, and as Paul finishes Romans 9, is chapter 10, verse 1. If you look there, the very next chapter, the opening verse, he says, Brothers, my heart's desire in what? Prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. You're never going to have a burden for the lost. I never, I've noticed this in my own life. My burden wanes, increases and decreases in conjunction with if I'm praying for certain people. And that's what Paul says here. It's right clear. I have this burden and because of, and it's combined with prayer. I'm praying to God for them, what? That they may be saved. For them, he's talking about his own Jewish people. But you should also pray, Lord, give me this burden. I don't have it. I, I, I mean, there are times as our lives go through different waves and struggles and times and seasons as God providentially sees over all things. Pray, Lord, give me this burden. I don't have that. And sometimes it's hard to have a burden for certain people because they might be a little bit rough around the age, edges. I was wrestling with that myself recently. I thought, well, I'm rough around the edges too. I'm sure I've pinched more than one person. So pray, Lord, give me a burden. But pray for them. Pray by name. If there's somebody that God providentially has brought into your life, could be a neighbor, could be a grandchild or a child, pray for them by name. Could be a parent. Could be a, a friend at school. So let me give you specifics what to pray for them under this first application of prayer. What should you pray for unbelievers? Well, Paul makes it clear here. Number one, you pray that they would be saved. That's the first thing you pray for. He said it in Romans 10 in that opening verse. My heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. That's the simplistic, most direct prayer, yes. But there's more involved. <clears throat> Number two, this is important. Pray that they would not just acknowledge that they are sinners. Pray that they would not just acknowledge that they are sinners, but they would come to the end of themselves. Pray that they would not just acknowledge that they are sinners, but they would come to the end of themselves. I've seen it over too many times, many times in presentations. Uh, do you agree with God you're a sinner? Yeah. Okay, check. Next. Do you agree Jesus is God? Yes. Okay. Would you like to? Yes. Okay. Okay. Next. Okay. Now what do we do next? Is that how Peter responded when he came face to face with Christ? Remember in our study of Luke? Cast the net over here. But Lord, Lord, we've been fishing all night. We haven't caught anything. But because you said it, we'll do it. And they couldn't hold the net, couldn't hold all the fish. What was Peter's response? Uh, yeah. Check. Lord, I'm a sinner. Uh, yeah, I believe who you are. I, I'm the one who's about to say you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll accept you by faith. What was Peter's response? Luke 5, verse 8. But when Simon Peter saw it, saw what? The nets and all the catch. He fell down at Jesus' knees saying, depart from me, for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. <laughs> he didn't ask the Lord to come to him. He said, get away from me. Because he realized the stench and the corruption of his sinfulness before a holy God. It wasn't business as usual, nor was the tax collector with the Pharisee. You know that parable in Luke 18. The Pharisee's like, well, I'm better than everyone else, right? I do this, I do that. The tax collector couldn't even look up to heaven. He looked down and beat his chest, and he said, the text says, the tax collector, Luke 18, 13, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. So that's what you pray for your unbelieving family and friends. That they won't just simply acknowledge, yeah, I'm a sinner. But like the tax collector, like Peter, they would come to the end of themselves. Lord, depart from me, I'm a sinner. Be merciful to me, I'm a sinner. Number three, what can you pray for them? Pray that they would believe that Jesus is God. They have to believe that. Otherwise, they'll never be saved. That's John 20. Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, verses 30 and 31 of John 20. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that's deity, and that by believing you may have life in his name. 
He wasn't just a good moral teacher. He was God in the flesh. Number four, what should you pray for them? Pray that they would acknowledge Jesus as Lord. I was going over this passage with my one of my daughters the, just the other day, yesterday. Romans 10, 9, a favorite of one of our men. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Savior, no. He is a Savior. But there he says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Yeah, I'll accept him as my Savior, but not as my Lord. Since when do we dissect the person of Jesus Christ? Number five, pray that they would believe in Jesus' resurrection. They have to believe that to be saved. Romans 10, 9 continues. Acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. Confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Then you will be saved. There is no salvation apart from that. Now look, there are many people who acknowledge the reality of the historical fact of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and are still not saved. Of course, when Paul is talking about faith, he's talking about genuine faith. I believe that it's a historical reality that Christ died on a tree. He was a curse on a tree on, on Calvary. And then, yeah, historically he rose from the dead. But now I'm trusting my soul. I'm committing my life to him in faith. Number six, pray that they would not be choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life. Pray that they would not be choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, but that the seed of the word of God would fall on good soil. Pray that they would not be choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, but in contrast, that the seed of the word of God would fall on good soil. That's Luke 8 where Christ says the seed is the word of God. Verses 14 to 15, and as for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear, so they hear the truth of the gospel that you give them, but as they go on their way, they are choked by what? The cares and the riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. As for that in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word of God, they also hear, they hold it fast in an honest and good heart, and bear fruit with patience. Bear fruit with patience. Number seven, as you pray for them, pray that they would not just go through a religious experience, but they would be born again. There's a difference. Pray that they would not just go through a religious experience, but they would be born again. John 3, truly, truly I say to you, Jesus to Nicodemus, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. 1 Peter 1, 23. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. I was talking with somebody the other day, and we were talking about, and I hear it from friends of mine that I grew up with, that they say, well, I'm not a kid anymore. I've, I'm done doing all the stuff I used to do. The womanizing, the drinking, all that stuff. I've turned over a new leaf. We're not talking about reformation, though we always pray for reformation in the church, just like the Protestant Reformation. We're talking about regeneration. We're not talking about somebody in their own strength muster up enough things to turn over a new leaf, and now they're living a good moral life. We're talking about a spiritual birth, regeneration. Number eight, pray that they would forsake anything that they are clinging to in order to gain Christ. When you pray for them, pray that they would forsake anything that they are clinging to in order to gain Christ alone. I've heard so many times people say it was a Catholic dear friend of mine that I used to witness and give the gospel to in New York, and he went to his Catholic priest. God was beginning, it seemed like, to open his eyes to the truth, that justification is by faith alone. And he said, let me go check with my Catholic priest. I said, don't go to the Catholic priest. Let's look at what the Bible says. And he was memorizing scripture with me. For example, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned, Okay, Stu, t tell me, uh, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Great. Uh, I ask, is that refer to Mary? Um, but a lot of people who grew up in a Catholic background, they want to add Christ to what they're already holding on to. Notice what, listen to what Paul says in Philippians 3, cha chapter 3. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh... I have more. I'm circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, which I shared earlier, 
a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. In other words, look at my resume. Nobody has a better spiritual resume than me. Then he says, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. It's not your own righteousness. It's the righteousness of Christ alone. You can't add Christ to the mix. You have to forsake and abandon all the other things. Number nine, pray that they would be willing to examine the scriptures with you. That's something I'm doing with our men in our men's group, training them in how to read the scriptures, not with a fellow believer, but with a fellow unbelieving friend or family member. John 5, 39, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. People need to examine the scriptures. And lastly, number 10, pray that God would take away their blindness. Because that's an important one, right? Because that's where we get frustrated. At least I know that for me, and I would imagine also for you, that when, when it seems that everything is clear, that they're engaging with you and, and that you're discussing the scripture with them, and I'm not just talking about a one-time, an ongoing event, and not, not just an event, an ongoing thing. And you say, wow, they're, they're, they're close. Well, what, what's holding them back? This is what's holding them back. 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ through his image of God. So in the same way that who gave sight to the physical sight to the blind man in John 9? Was it the blind man or his parents? No, it was Jesus. In the same manner, no one can give spiritual sight other than God himself. So when you get to the point when you're frustrated, that's when you need to be praying this. So pray. Number two, the second P is plight. You have to understand the plight or the condition that people without Christ are in. I'll just rattle these off for you. There's, I got eight. There's a lot more. Your burden for lost people will be like Paul's when you understand what the Bible says about them. You know what the Bible says about them? Number one, they are lost. Luke 19, 10. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. They're lost. They're, they don't think they are, but we know that they are. They're lost. They're wandering. They don't know where they're. It's like a lost sheep. Number two, they're separated from Christ. Ephesians 2, 12. Number three, again, Ephesians 2, 12. They are without hope. They are without hope. They're hopeless. Number four, again from Ephesians 2.12, they are without God. They're separated from Christ without hope and without God. Number five, they are under the wrath of God. John 3.36, John the Baptist said, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Well, when I understand, well, my my child or my grandchild or my brother or sister in my family or my aunt or my co-worker or my fellow student who's not believing they're under the wrath of God that will help me be burdened for them number six they are harassed and helpless sheep without a shepherd that's Matthew, Matthew 9 36 when Jesus was moved within his bowels number seven they cannot find rest for their souls because they are spiritually working hard with religion and self-righteousness. And actually, that might be some of you here today. Are you trying to find rest for your eternal soul? If you're trying by working hard, if you're trying by religion, if you're trying by your self-righteousness, I can assure you, I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that you will never find rest for your soul. And neither will your friends. Matthew 11, come to me all who labor, Jesus says, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What kind of rest is he talking about? Take my yoke, spiritual rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lonely in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. What freedom. 
There is in that. And lastly, they are perishing, 1 Corinthians 1.18. That's the plight of your non-believing friends and family. Be burdened for them. Number three, the third P is prepare. If you're burdened for them, you pray for them, you, you realize their plight, according to what Scripture says, and you prepare. As I have mentioned earlier, I'm preparing and training and teaching the men how to lead an evangelistic study with non-believing audience through the Gospel of John. And last but not least, this is important, persevere. And this is what I mean by that. We're talking in the context of being burdened for the lost. That's the context of our passage. Sometimes our burden that's on fire for our lost family and friends, sometimes water can be poured on that fire. You know when I've noticed that happens with me? Is either when the person I'm trying to reach out to is either, either apathetic or antagonistic towards the gospel. One of those two extremes. Either they're like, they'll they'll be polite and listen to you, but they're like, that's not for me. They're apathy. Sometimes it's even harder versus the ones who are aggressive with you and antagonistic. I actually like them. I get antagonistic with them. <laughs> Don't let those who have shown apathy or resistance to the gospel dictate your burden. Okay? It's going to happen. But don't let it happen. Be in prayer for them. Know their plight. Prepare and persevere. Let me close with this quote. Steve Lawson's little book. He has a line of books in the, in the line of godly men. And this particular one is called The Gospel Focus of Charles Spurgeon. And he shares in this book at the outset, as I'm going to read a portion of it, what we're studying here in Romans 9 is an extension of Ephesians 1, the work of the Father. When he came to understand Steve Lawson, the doctrine of God's sovereignty and salvation, it was a blessing to him. But as you'll hear me say from his own pen, it was a challenge to him because he said, I'm a preacher. I'm a proclaimer of the good news. How, how does it affect that? Do I still tell people the good news? If God is sovereign, what's going on here? How do I reconcile those two things? Listen to what he says. He said, quote, as a young seminary student, I was first confronted with the biblical truth of the sovereignty of God and salvation. To that point, I viewed salvation as a joint venture between God and man. I assume that God extends the offer of salvation, but man has the ability to accept it or reject it. But unexpectedly, the sovereign grace of God toward those whom he chose in eternity past to save was made known to me. To my amazement, my eyes were opened to behold God as I had never seen him before. A thick fog lifted. Suddenly, I could see those truths in the Bible known as the doctrines of grace. Astonishingly, they had been there all along. As my eyes raced through the scriptures, I became absorbed with an endless number of verses teaching the predestining grace of God. For every one verse I saw, there were a hundred more virtually leaping from the pages of God's word, screaming for my attention. From Genesis to Revelation, the Bible was now declaring, salvation is of the Lord, he said. This discovery, he continues, was at first devastating. I was shaken to the core of my being. My whole orientation to the Bible was an upheaval. And this is a seminary student. When he was at my, at my alma mater, actually, he said, this biblical teaching was pride-crushing. I was laid low in the dust, my soul desolate. But at the same time, these doctrines were God-glorifying and, and Christ-exalting. They lifted me up with a sense of awe toward God and filled me with excitement. Joy flooded my being. These glorious truths ignited a great awakening within me, one from which I have not recovered. And then he says this. This deeper understanding of God's grace, however, created an enormous dilemma for me. How would the doctrines of sovereign grace affect my preaching? If God is sovereign in salvation, why preach the gospel? If I'm to do so, how do I preach the gospel? Why witness? Why pray for the lost? Why make sacrifices for the gospel? These questions haunted me, especially since I was called to preach. Perhaps they have challenged you. As I wrestled through these issues, I walked into the seminary bookstore one day to browse among the books. On this occasion, I noticed several volumes of sermons by Charles Spurgeon. K. 
curious, I pulled one off the shelf and began reading. Quite frankly, I was not prepared for what I found. As I poured over the pages, I found message after message dripping with the biblical truths of sovereign grace. But at the same time, each message was on fire with evangelistic fervor as Spurgeon pleaded with sinners to be saved. Never had I read anything like this. These sermons were like an electric current running through my soul. On one hand, he firmly held the sovereignty of God and man's salvation. And with the other hand, he extended the free offer of the gospel to all. He preached straightforward Calvinistic doctrine, then in the same sermon, fervently urged lost sinners to call on the name of the Lord. Having expounded the truth of predestination, he then warned his listeners that if they refused Christ, their blood would be on their hands. In sermon after sermon, this prolific preacher expounded God's sovereign grace with unmistakable precision. Yet, he did it with a genuine passion for the lost. End quote. We believe, as certain as Jesus is God, as certain as Jesus came here to earth, as certain that he died on the cross of Calvary, as certain as he rose again from the dead, as certain that our declaration of righteousness we have made right with God by faith alone, as certain as we are of those things, we are certain that our salvation is of the Lord because of his sovereign election. But that doesn't mean we lose our burden for lost people. It means it ignites the fire within. And if it doesn't, pray that God would do it for you. Pray for your lost family and friends. If today you do not, you might profess Christ, but you might not possess Christ. Many said on the last day, Lord, Lord, we prophesied and cast out demons and healed in your name. We taught Sunday school in your name. We led youth groups in your name. We taught from the pulpit in your name. And Christ said, depart from me, I never knew you. If you just profess Christ but don't possess Christ, you need to understand what I read earlier as we pray for people, that your plight is precarious. You're under the wrath of God. You don't know if tomorrow is promised to you. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. You have to come to the end of yourself like Peter and the tax collector and say, Lord, I'm a wretched sinner. I deserve your punishment. You would be just to punish me and send me to hell. But thank you for the good news, the evangel of the gospel, that there was a substitute not only on the cross of Calvary, but a substitute in life because you demanded God that I would live my life perfectly from the day I was born to the day I die. How are you doing? Only Jesus ever did that. And you turn to Jesus, forsaken all other things, your religion, your self-righteousness, whatever you're trying to cling on to. And you turn to Christ by faith alone. And then you can truly not only profess Christ, but possess him. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word this morning. We need to hear it. I needed to hear it as I was preparing. Because there are times when... We, don't have for, we might have for certain people more of a burden than we do for others. But Lord, give us the same burden that Paul had, this fervent zeal that we would feel great sorrow and unceasing anguish, that we would wish we were damned for the sake of a lost child, a co-worker who is harassed and helpless without a shepherd, an aunt or uncle who is under the wrath of God, a classmate who is lost. Father, we desire to see you use us as your instruments, as your vessels.